Welcome back, everyone, to the Welby Show and Podcast. I am so excited about this conversation today and my guest today. With me is Andrea Sims Brown, who is an international board certified lactation consultant and the founder of Baby in the Family. She was the lactation consultant guru. And I say guru because I mean it 100%. Um, that really saved me. And you know, I talk a lot about empowerment uh, and being empowered in your own health and, you know, really feeling like no matter what you have, you know, that you're dealing with, whether it's a disease or just a health journey, like the breastfeeding journey or the pregnancy journey, that you really are the one that's going to take the reins. But for this, I will say she saved me and I give away my power freely because I was so grateful. And I say that because she was the I think third or fourth lactation consultant that I'd spoken with uh, in the first three months of my uh, son's life and my breastfeeding journey. And of course, this is my first child, so I didn't know what to expect. I knew that breastfeeding was incredibly important and beneficial, um, and I have pulled a number of statistics out that I'm going to share in a moment about that. And so I knew it was something I was committed to, but I had no idea how hard and complicated it was going to be. And so by the time I spoke to Andrea, I was actually a day away from fully quitting. I was just going to throw in the towel at three months and say, you know, I did my best. Um, and the previous 10 days before I spoke to her, I had introduced formula and it was actually uh, not, not totally formula. I was, you know, half and half each day, but nursing and, 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 um, and some pumped milk and formula, but I cried. It was the only time in the first three months of his life that I cried. I felt so defeated and I just felt so badly that I, you know, was giving him, you know, not what I wanted to give him, which was my breast milk. Um, but it all turned around because of Andrea. So first of all, Andrea, welcome. Thank you so much for doing this. It's my pleasure, Adrian. You have no idea how happy I am and proud I am of you. Thank you. Well, I sung your praises to anybody who would listen. And I had a lot of friends having babies at the exact same time who then worked with you and felt similarly. Um, but now I want to sing your praises to the whole world. And also just to explain my breastfeeding journey uh, for any expecting mothers, for current mothers, um, and anybody who might have a child in the future or who is a, a grandparent or somebody who can say, you know, there's another way when they see people struggling because or making decisions that maybe aren't entirely informed. And so I want to share the rest of my journey and, and what happened and what you helped me with before we dive into all the questions I have for you, just to make sure that people understand. So though I was definitely a proponent of breastfeeding because of all the benefits and uh, you know important health impact that I knew it would have for my son in the beginning and for his entire life. I was really shocked about how challenging it was. So from the beginning, my son wouldn't latch on one of my breasts. So I was then nursing him on the other one entirely and pumping. I think it was I was nursing on the left and pumping on the right after about two weeks because he had for lack of a better term, just annihilated my nipple. And it was so painful each time he then nursed that it wasn't able to heal. And so I had this wonderful doula and she came to do her postpartum visit. And she took one look at my right nipple and said, girl, stop. You got to give that one a rest. It's got to heal. And so I did that. You know, you see how these little decisions start to uh, shape the journey. And I think that happens in so many different health journeys. You know, you take one drug and then all of a sudden there's a couple of side effects. And the next thing you know, you're taking a cocktail and it throws something else out in your body. And, you know, you go on, you go and you go. And next thing you know, you're in this total mess of a situation. And so after nursing on one side and pumping on the other, you know, the supply got off, right? This, the left had a much bigger supply because as you told me, the pump only takes out a third of what the baby can take out. So then, you know, your, your body is listening to whatever you're doing. And so when I was only pumping on the right, it thought, okay, the baby doesn't need as much on this side. So I was getting less from there. And then, you know, I made the decision very sleep deprived to pump so that I would be able to sleep, you know, several hours in the night rather 
rather than waking up. And I had, for whatever reason, breasts that never leaked, never leaked once in my entire journey and, and never really hurt that much either. And so I didn't have to wake up in the night to pump. It just didn't wake me up, which was amazing. Or if it ever did kind of get a little uncomfortable, I could roll over and no problem. And so I didn't know enough and I didn't have anybody like Andrea to, to talk to and ask about this, but I, you know, this really messed with my supply again, because of course my body thought, okay, the baby doesn't need to eat at night. And so I wasn't making, you know, quite as much or, or things were just not working as they normally would because I wasn't actually doing what he was eating, right? I was pumping into a bottle, then he was eating in the night, but my body didn't, of course, doesn't know he's eating in the night because he's not nursing. And so things just got slowly more and more out of whack. And I was very fortunate to have a baby nurse help me with my first child. My husband and I were living in a remote area without any family around. And this was something that our families thought would be really helpful to us. And it was, but she wasn't a lactation expert, but she was giving me a lot of tips about, you know, what to do and that he was hungry and all these things. And so we started doing, you know, pumped backup bottles. And, you know, I saw three or four different lactation consultants thinking I had all these supply issues. And, and it, almost every time I was nursing him after, you know, about a month or two, he was crying and fussing and, and it would take an hour. And, and I heard these stories of people that, you know, it was easy and they, they took 20, 30 minutes to nurse. And I was shocked. And, you know, what was I doing wrong? And I was just so defeated. I just, I just thought he was hungry all the time and the crying. And I started to get resentful, honestly, because listening to a baby cry, you know, for an hour and sort of fighting with them and just being like, just eat it, you know, and, and you're, you're both upset that you can't give the baby what you think he needs and wants, but also eventually a bit frustrated and resentful, as I said, that just about the, the agita that, that it was, you know, the experience, the negativity energy that that was going on at each nursing and I heard people say oh it's beautiful it's bonding and I was like you're out of your mind you know this is this is a nightmare and so or it's just so unenjoyable you know and so many negative emotions come up each time that I was doing it and so Robin Burson who is the founder of Parsley Health who uh, I know she uh, posted something on Instagram and this is where social media is fabulous about how she'd had trouble nursing with her third child. And I was really amazed to hear this because my perception was that once you know how to do it, it's like riding a bike, that every child's going to be the same, every, you know, it's always going to be easy or it's, or it's going to be the same experience each time. And that's not true at all. She was having quite a lot of trouble with her third and she found you and, and you really helped her. And so she said, you know, it's a very different approach just give it a, just give it a go. And I did. And, you know, it was so hard to connect and we, we had to cancel like three or four times because when I was nursing was not when we had scheduled, you know, at this virtual zoom consult and finally it worked. And it was one of those days where I just felt like this, the stars had a line because it was actually the day my baby nurse was leaving, uh, for, for good. And first of all, I was using a breastfeeding pillow and you explained that, you know, the positioning was not right. And that it was simply my child was not low enough. He wasn't tugging on my nipple the way that, you know, when you see like a cow, right, you're really, you're really yanking, you're really pulling. And so simply gravity was not on my side. And right. so, you know, that was just such a simple change, but, but a profound one. And looking back, you know, if I had worked with you from the beginning, I wouldn't have used a pillow. But at that point, you know, he was too comfortable with it and blah, blah, blah. And so just over 24 hours since I had the first session with you, uh, not only did dropping help, but it was more about any, you know, 90% of, of what you helped me with was understanding his cues and understanding that he was actually crying because he was full. And that my supply was fine and that I was listening to all these other people around me, most notably my baby nurse who was trying to convince me that, you know, he was either hungry or that I was, you know, my supply wasn't up and this and that. Um, and I just didn't know enough and I didn't know how to understand his cues. And so as soon as I listened to him and kind of understood when he turned away and that he, you know, he was fine, um, it just got just exponentially easier overnight. I mean, you know, and I never used a backup bottle again. I never used formula from that day, 
which was at the three month mark, I think he was 12 or 13 weeks, until about six or seven months old, when I just decided to introduce one bottle of formula for mostly for for my own, I guess, freedom, sanity, I don't know, just just to have a little bit of a relief, you know, and also because uh, formula is a bit thicker and helps him to be more full going to sleep. I am still nursing. I'm actually, you know, he's over nine months old now. I love the experience. It takes, you know, 10 minutes now, uh, each nursing session, if that, no crying ever. And I just can't believe how close I was to giving up and how it turned around and how, you know, different it was as an experience. We have so much more to talk about based on your experience and and everything that you have learned and been able to help me with. And I should also mention that even though things changed dramatically overnight, truly, you know, within 24 hours of, of our session, Andrea, you then were very supportive to me in a time when you were going through so much losing your husband. And I just couldn't even believe how there for me, you were in what should have been a time when you were totally not worried about me. Uh, But we were messaging all the time through this, you know, secure uh, app. And I think it was about three or four weeks of that afterward where challenges were still coming up, you know, it wasn't perfect. Um, And with sleep and this and that and nursings and when and how much and this and that and you know and you continue to just kind of remind me to listen to his cues and you know little things here and there you would say okay I would do this or I would do that but you know it was just it was this very gentle reminder whenever I reached out that he is very intelligent and that he is giving me all that I need to know with his signs and cues and um, that everything happens for a reason as far as, you know, sometimes babies just cry. That's true. But most of the time you can try to figure out, you know, why and what's going on. And and he's not just trying to annoy me. (laughs) So that was really great. And I think in that experience, you also gave me this extra level of respect for this tiny baby, which I don't think I had before. You know, I really felt like he was wise in his own way and that I could have this kind of mutual, (laughs) respectful relationship instead of just like, oh, why is he doing this? He's just, you know, trying to drive me crazy. Or also beating myself up all the time that I was, you know, why is he doing this? I must be doing something wrong. And that sometimes you could just have a situation where you're trying to understand what's going on, but it's neither your fault nor the baby's fault. Just is, right? It's just whatever's happening. And that's really how it all went down. So anybody who uh, is listening to this summer of 2022 um, knows that the formula shortage in the United States is a big news piece. And for some families, very, very scary and intense, and they can't feed their children. And you may not know this, but the whole reason there's a shortage is because there was an Abbott plant in Michigan that had quality control issues and several infants have now died and a few others have been sick and hospitalized as a result. And this is an unfolding story that the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal are reporting on. And the reason that they are reporting on this is because there are documents showing that Abbott actually and a whistleblower came forward showing that Abbott actually received official complaints of unsafe and unsanitary conditions way before, I think early 2021, before, you know, these, these infants actually died and they had to recall the formula and shut the plant down. So uh, very, very sad and troubling. I mean, to think that somebody would put babies in harm's way and, 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 and then not do something before they have to die is so so raw to me on so many levels being a mother now it just it just infuriates me um and i hope they pay dearly for what they have done um but anyway so that is the latest but going back to 2017 when i started gathering these health news pieces there's a 2017 study showing that breastfeeding is linked to lower endometriosis risk 
in mothers. There's a 2017 study showing that 80% of infant formulas tested were positive for arsenic, which is associated with developmental defects, cardiovascular disease, neurotoxicity, diabetes, and even cancer. All of this was according to the World Health Organization. Another 2017 study showed that even partial breastfeeding for the first few months lowers SIDS risk, so sudden infant death syndrome. In 2018, the U.S. was the only nation to oppose a World Health Organization breastfeeding resolution because of the lobbying power of the almost entirely U.S.-based formula industry, which happens to also be one of the few countries to allow direct consumer advertising for baby formula. Many people don't know, for example, in the U.K., you cannot advertise baby formula. Um, And so this was very eye-opening to me. Also in 2018, a study showed that breastfeeding is as good for the mother's health as the baby's. And then in 2019, a study showed that breast milk colonizes the microbiome, which formula cannot. And in 2020, research suggested that breastfeeding was associated with a reduced risk of early menopause. Another 2020 study showed that breastfeeding babies reduced a woman's ovarian cancer risk. And then a 2022 American Heart Association study that showed how breastfeeding decreased the risk of heart disease for women overall. So, so much here. I mean, for people that say formula is the same as breast milk, I hope you just heard what I said and you can see clearly it is not. It is not even close. Um, And not only is breast milk so important and breastfeeding so important and so helpful from a health perspective, but formula has real issues, as we can see with what I just mentioned with the arsenic and these current, you know, the shortages and and these, um, these infant deaths due to contamination. But I will say before we get to Andrea's interview and actually get all of her wisdom, that there are families that have no choice, right? They're, they're born prematurely, they're adopted, there's so many different reasons. And so those families can't do anything about it. And for that, there are some very healthy formulas. I am currently now weaning and, you know, my son takes formula every day and I feel very good about the formula that he takes. It's actually European. Uh, so I'm not having any shortage issues, but I, you know, have no problem giving it to him. And I know it's chock full of excellent excellent nutrition, and I'm not worried about the quality. So for that, I don't want to put anybody into a worried state or make them feel shame or whatever. What I'm talking about is a lot of the misinformation out there that it's that it's exactly the same and that for women who just make that choice, who just decide, you know, it's not working for me, I just don't want to, that there's a different way to look at the situation, both because it's so important and also because it doesn't need to be so hard, as Andrea has showed me. So uh, first of all, why is it so hard? Why is it, you know, so complicated, Andrea? That's a really great question. You know, um, what I've learned in the 30 plus years that I've been doing this is that we're at fault. We in the medical community are at fault. We make it hard for you. And it turns out that if a woman or anybody who wants to breastfeed holds her baby in a comfortable position, baby knows what to do. So we need to be the ones that give mothers back the control over their bodies and have them understand what you learned, which is the baby is motivated to do his or her job. And your job as the lactating parent is to facilitate that process. So breastfeeding is hard for many reasons. The number one reason that breastfeeding is hard is because we make it hard for mothers. The second reason is because you have to show up. You have to show up. If you plan to breastfeed or are choosing to breastfeed your child, then it means that you need to be with your child. And for many families, that can be somewhat distressing and difficult because, you know, giving birth is an event. It's over at some point. Lactating and breastfeeding goes on and on and on. It's a process. And so for some families, fatigue and the stress of not knowing how much a baby is taking and if the baby is satiated or not can be the reason that they find it so challenging. Ultimately, once you get past the concept of, oh, this baby knows what he's doing or she's doing, this is my part, and I understand what baby's communicating to me, then everything becomes much simpler. And that's where 
I feel my colleagues and I have sort of done mothers and specifically mothers who choose to breastfeed a disservice. We don't give you the information to empower you to just continue and do your thing. Well, and what was so amazing to me from the now looking back and starting to work with you was that, you know, this is something that really people should should do before they even give birth because those those first few days are so critical in you getting the confidence that you can do it and also the positioning right right like when i finally met with you it was too late for austin to not have a breastfeeding pillow and nobody absolutely nobody told me or that i read or whatever that you know that that there was another way to do it that you didn't need the pillow. Um, so I really wish that more women as part of their, you know, they set the crib up, they get all the little clothes. They should also be doing a session or just, you know, doing some education before they give birth so that they understand what's coming and how to kind of do it right from the beginning. And I will also mention that I was able to work from home and because I work for myself, I decided because the breastfeeding was so, it was so challenging in the beginning. And then because I was so committed to it to push my maternity leave from four months to six months, because it was, you know, so challenging to really be available to be nursing and then have scheduled things, right, with clients and with interviews and things like that. So that was a decision I could make, but a lot of families can't do that. And a lot of mothers don't work from home. And uh, separating from your baby, as you said, is a way of not showing up. And the pump does not do the exact same thing. So uh, while the pump is a lifesaver in a lot of ways, and I'm glad that we have it, you're not going to have the same exact supply if you're only pumping or you're pumping for the majority of the, the nursings. And this is some somewhere where I think society really falls down. I've always thought it was a bit ironic, right? The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that women breastfeed exclusively for, you know, the first six months and breastfeed for six months to a year. But if you want women to do that, why is our maternity leave not a minimum of six months? Because you're asking women to then leave their baby. Most people don't work from home. And how can they nurse? And then their supply is going to get all out of whack. So it's in conflict. Immediately, it's in conflict. Um, so I, I think that's one of the biggest challenges is, is and why it's so hard is society, a l- real lack of education pre-birth, as you said. But I also don't want you to throw yourself in with the other medical professionals because you are not doing any disservice to, to women in this way. Um, so we're talking about day one, right? What is the one thing you wish women knew from day one that, you know, if you could tell them right now, what would you say? I would say the number one thing to remember is that your baby's born motivated to be fed and to feed him or herself. And if that's not happening for whatever reason, medical separations, whatever, the power is in your hands. So you can literally squeeze or hand express the colostrum, which is you know, a honey-like textured syrup, basically early milk that comes out of your breast specifically for a baby. And so if we can get moms to understand all they need to do if the baby's in the NICU or wherever, sit there and just literally or lie there and literally squeeze your areola, the milk will come out and have your baby either lick it off of your finger or collect it because that also triggers lactation. So the mothers who didn't get that message are holding this colostrum in their breast and it tells the brain, eh, baby didn't make it, so we don't need this milk. And their breasts become uncomfortably engorged. So the, the, the real trick is to get the colostrum out and deliver it to baby, including if baby is not latching him or herself. That's fine. We can figure that out afterwards, but getting the milk out, that's the key. Yeah. And as I've told several friends who have asked me for help after the fact, you know, which I always think is funny because if my myself at two months could see the future and know that I was then advising people on what to do by the time I was, you know, seven, eight months, like I I would have laughed because I was, A, I hated it so much. It was so awful. And I thought I was so bad at it and blah, blah. But anyway, what I like to tell them is that, you know, he or she has never breastfed before day one. So of course, he's going to not be that good at it. I mean, it's, 
you know, you're both like learning as you're doing it. And now my son is, you know, quote unquote, a pro. The second he's done nursing, he just catapults himself off the breastfeeding pillow and just starts crawling around the room doing what he wants. I mean, he is so in charge. It's hilarious, but they get so much better at it every single day and every single time they're doing it that if people are freaking out that it's not perfect or the latch is off and da 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 from day one, it probably is, you know, it's gonna, it it improves (laughs) really dramatically. Of all the different breastfeeding issues that you see, and I know you see a lot, what is really the most common one? Is it more on the latching side? Is it a tongue tie? Is it supply? Like, what what do you think? Right. Well, all of these things are related. So I want to back up a little bit because you know how I am. Babies are born with an innate ability, literally synapses in the brain, neural pathways that say, this is what you're going to do when you're born, which is why they practice sucking in utero. You know, if you have images of your baby, you'll see him sucking on his wrist, sucking on his knuckles sucking on his fingers. Um, So they're born with this innate ability and we take it away from them by, you know, doing some things that are not helpful. So to specifically answer the question, the number one issue that mothers face when they choose to breastfeed are sore nipples. So when we look at, okay, you've got sore nipples. Why do you have sore nipples? Well, there's a series of questions that you know I ask. Well, how are you holding your baby? What's going on with your baby's oral anatomy? So a sore nipple could be Great positioning, great alignment, everything's great, but baby has an oral restriction. And for your listeners, an oral restriction usually lays in the tongue. It's the tongue's job to suckle or pull milk out of your body. And so if that tongue is not functioning as it should, and your tongue is not just one muscle, it's a series of muscles that have to work together really well to do what it needs to do. So if there's a neurological issue in the baby or a tonal issue, then the latch and the suckle then suffers. If mother's supply is not there, then baby may be sucking really hard, but not getting much milk. So it all begins with that attachment or latch, like you said, figuring out what's going on there, things tend to get much better. But most mothers, most women who choose to breastfeed experience some kind of nipple soreness in the first 48 hours. And that is where in the hospital environment or birthing center environment, we can intervene and say, well, let me help you figure out where the epicenter of this challenge is. Is it in the latching itself? Issues with the baby's mouth? What are, what's going on so that you can get home and have a plan for moving forward? Something you said just now made me think of something else, which is that you want to get to the epicenter of the problem. And that's Welby's mission, you know, for so many things, which is root cause resolution, right? Like, let's keep going yeah. upstream to, yeah. you know, they will take irritable bowel syndrome, which is a completely nonsense term, right? And so what is causing your irritable bowel? And you go up and then, well, it's irritated because I'm having constipation or bloating. Yeah, but what is causing that? And it's like, okay, well, you know, this, even if it's like, well, it's because I've got this candida or something. Well, but why is the candida allowed to stay in your body, right? You Something else is going on that it can flourish and you can keep going upstream and eventually get to like, a reason, which is, you know, sometimes a gut dysbiosis, a poor diet, or, you know, something where you're continuing to allow particular yeast to grow, right? So that's kind of what, that's something that always has really intrigued me and been a focus of mine. And the same is true with breastfeeding challenges. You know, you keep going upstream to the issue. And sometimes it is something where I, you know, my, my sister-in-law had three boys, breastfed them all. And all three of them had tongue ties and all three of them got this little, I think it's a little like laser snip kind of a thing. And the situation improved overnight and they could nurse, you know, more easily. I know not every tongue tie is the same. So not all of them require any kind of snip. Sometimes it's something that you can just work with. I think you may have even told me in the very beginning, like, cause I was so uh, convinced that Austin had a tongue tie and I asked you, and there were a couple of other people that I was able to show in person and all of them said, you know, no, uh, not really. And you said, you know, he might have a little one, but it, it's it's not something that is preventing him from being a good breastfeeding baby. So we're just going to kind of like move on from that because it's not a root cause worth doing something about. And it's certainly not the one thing that's messing this up. There's There's other stuff going on. And that was really good for me to hear because I thought it was sort of a black and white thing, right? You have a tongue tie, you must cut it. And that's the main problem. And that's not 
that's not always the case. Um, I have a scoliosis. It's only 15 degrees, right? And, and I remember seeing somebody and I have back pain and they said, sure, you also have a scoliosis and it contributes, but that is not the main thing going on here. You don't need a surgery. Like it's not the end all be all root cause of your issues. You know, I had some hip stuff, whatever. So I think that was a really good distinction you made that you can have those issues. It's, it's all about finding the root cause as to why the nipple is messed up, but there might be three and they're not all requiring intervention, right? So, okay, so that's very interesting that uh, the sore nipple, and I had such sore nipples, is, is kind of the most uh, common thing. So you, you, you identified the sore nipple. What do you think is the most common upstream issue from the sore nipple? Positioning. Oftentimes when I work with a family, I often, the first thing I say is, well, show me what you've been doing, because I understand the issues that you're facing. I understand the challenges that we're trying to overcome. So show me what you've been doing. Let me understand where the issue really lies by observing. So I quietly observe what's going on when this baby is being fed. And I would say between 85 and 90% of the time, the baby's uncomfortable. So if a baby is lying sideways, or on his side or her side on a pillow and trying to eat with his head sideways, that can be a bit of a challenge because a human being can't do that easily. So positioning means what's the baby's body position being held in? Is he lying down? Is he sitting up? Is he lying on his back? What position is he in? And if we can figure out, okay, this is not working. We already identified that. Let's come up with a position that this baby would appreciate for drinking or eating in this case, drinking really. And that's where that's where most of the problems tend to lie. The baby's lying on a pillow, like you know, sideways and having his head pushed forward to the breast. And the way that our anatomy works is if you push a human head forward, the only thing that's going to happen is the chin's going to go down. And as I said to you, take a sip of something with your chin on your chest. How's that feel? Right? So if you're going to drink tequila, you got to lift your chin. And having a baby in a position that allows him or her just to lift his chin, 95% of the time that takes care of the pain. Now that I'm weaning and I have less milk, uh, I've noticed it's even more important because, you know, he really has to tug to get it out. And if I'm just slouching a little bit, it's just not coming out in the same way. And I can tell he's wanting more, looking for more and not able to really like get what he needs out. So it, it's, it goes on and continues to be important when you're weaning too. Speaking of weaning, <laughs> how, how little breast milk can you give a baby for them and you, because I just mentioned a bunch of statistics about how helpful it is for the mother as well, to still reap all these health benefits? You know, when I was trained in human lactation science back in the 90s and 2000, um, my, one of my trainers said to us in class one day, she said, every drop counts. She goes, every drop counts. Cause when we look at one drop of breast milk under a microscope, it's like times square, you know, at midnight on, you know, January 1st, any year, except before the pandemic, there are billions, billions of things moving around in there. And we don't know what's going on, really. Honestly, we're scientists. We know everything. We don't know nothing. We know about this much. And there's this much to know, right? So that drop of milk makes a huge difference to your baby's health and to your health as well, as you mentioned, Adrian. And so my suggestion is always to any family who's struggling with supply or even choosing to wean, you know, just think of that bit of milk, whether it's a drop or an ounce or half an ounce, 10, 12 mLs, Think of it as medicine. You don't need a lot of medicine to get better. You need just a teaspoon. That's how important breast milk is. That's how important human milk is to the human body, to the biome, to the microbiome, to their brain, to their development, to everything, including something that we rarely talk about these days, bonding. That relationship, that relationship with you and your child, you can't get that back, right? And that happens with bottle feeding as well. But if you can use your own body, to produce the fluid for your baby, that makes a difference to their health and yours as well. Oh yeah, I have noticed the bonding for sure, especially since I went back to work and uh, we have a nanny. And so I don't get you know the quality time alone with him that I used to. I get it in the morning, in the evening and on the weekends, but 
being able to then just pop in and spend 10, 15 minutes with him and just, you know, look into each other's eyes and, and you really feel the oxytocin being released, you know, this, this mm-hmm. love hormone and uh, oxytocin is something that helps your body in so many different ways. And actually switching gears for a second, I just thought of something. I was amazed about the physical changes that happened to my uterus when I was in the hospital. Mm-hmm. When I started to breastfeed him, it started to contract and it felt like cramps the way that you might have, you know, when you're menstruating. Um, and it literally told my body that, okay, now the baby is here clearly because we are feeding it with, you know, the colostrum or breastfeeding it. So we can contract the lining of the, the uterus and then, because we're done here, we don't need to have it enlarged for the baby. And I couldn't believe it was, it was just amazing. And that went on for weeks as it continued to shrink down and down and down. Um, and I just think, oh man, how hard would it be to get your uterus to shrink again if you weren't breastfeeding at all? I mean, I'm sure it does, but it just, it doesn't take all these natural cues. Um, and I think this experience has really just showed me between the baby's cues and my own body's cues and listening to all these different things that are happening. You know, nature is brilliant. It's so brilliant. Yeah, she's been and around if, for a while. Right. And if we just let it do its thing, you know, between the baby wanting to, to feed, as you said, and, and, and listening to his or her cues and doing so uh, about what might be wrong or what he, he or she needs. Um, and then also your own body's ability to, to, to listen to your breastfeed and then do all these things as a result. It's, it's so magical. I just, I'm amazed. But moving on, so so every little drop counts. And you just reminded me that in the process of weaning, I'm going to make sure I keep a bottle of uh, frozen breast milk in the freezer for when he's sick. Um, because, you know, just to give him, like you said, a teaspoon is more than any medicine you can find on a shelf. And, you know, I think a lot of parents don't, you know, they, they pump enough, they, they kind of like get rid of everything in the freezer and they move on. But, um, you know, really giving him it as medicine when he's sick is, is a great idea as well. Okay. We talked about this briefly before, but this, I have another question for you. Is it true or is it a myth that your supply goes down when you're away from your baby, even if you're still pumping? And this is for all of my moms who have gone, you know, back to work or thinking of about you know being in the office or traveling, what happens? You know, you're right. Um, a breast pump was made in a factory, <laughs> and a baby was made in a uterus. So your body knows exactly the age and weight and health status of your baby, and it produces a, a specific blend of food for this child. When we separate the child from that lactating person and that person chooses to use a breast pump, there's no more feedback. When babies latch on, their saliva gets into your milk ducts and the saliva is carried up into the milk producing tissue and the body produces exactly what that baby needs if he has faced or been hit with a pathogen or a virus of some sort. So that's one of the feedbacks that we get from breastfeeding directly from the breast. When we use a breast pump, the breast pump creates negative pressure And that's it. But when baby breastfeeds, baby puts positive pressure on the areola, which then triggers the milk to let down. So, you know, all is not lost. All is not lost. I have many clients who choose to pump exclusively. And then I have mothers who are going back to work and we're breastfeeding and they want to continue providing their milk to their babies. So there are some tricks that we can employ to help this factory made breast pump act similarly, or at least remove as much milk as it can from your breast. Now a breast pump can effectively remove a third of the milk that's available. Babies can effectively remove two thirds of the milk that's available, which means that even when you finish pumping, your baby has access to a lot of milk. And even after baby has fed, your breasts still have a lot of milk in them and and can produce more milk. So for mothers or women going back to work and want to continue providing milk to their babies, there are three tricks that I want to tell your listeners that work for every mother that I've worked with in the last 30 years or so. Number one trick, if you're going into your office or your work situation anytime before noon, ideally before you leave your home, you should nurse your baby if you can. And then the minute you get to your job, 
pump immediately. And that's because your prolactin levels are highest overnight and early in the morning. And prolactin is the hormone, prolactin, make milk, that actually tells your body, make milk. Because it's true that babies will take just under half of their caloric need overnight. So all this night weaning we talk about, that's when the supply drops. So mothers often think, well, I'm going back to work in September. In August, we're going to night wean this baby. And then the supply drops. My recommendation is continue waking to feed your baby or pump as frequently as baby needs to, or as much as your breasts tell you that you need to get up and get milk out. And then once you start work, remember, you're going to pump within an hour or two of arriving, ideally within the hour. So if you get to work at eight o'clock in the morning, try to pump at least once before nine. The second trick is to have a protein snack. Protein snacks, some people tell me to have protein bars, um, they'll have some cheese, anything that's high in protein is known to increase your oxytocin level. And again, oxytocin is the hormone that pushes the milk out of your body or squeezes it out of your breasts. Holding your baby increases your oxytocin level. And you know what else does that? Sniffing the scent of your baby. So the third trick when you're pumping away from your baby, or exclusively, always have in your pocket or your pumping package, always have a used undershirt. It sounds weird, but it works. You know, so we're affecting all of the parts. We're getting the milk out based on biology, meaning getting it out in the morning. We're getting more milk out because we're actually increasing your oxytocin levels. And thirdly, we're having your brain assume that the baby is near, crying, fussing, sniffing, looking at videos of baby, all of these things in this third trick can help your body um, release more milk to a breast pump. So if you employ all of those and you'll do a little bit of massage before and during pumping, we can help the breast pump to remove more milk. The supply goes down because of a lack of removing that milk. So those are yes, tricks. those are fabulous. Uh, I wish I had known those before when I've, <laughs> I haven't left him much, uh, but I, when I, when I did, I remembered that I just kind of zoned out, you know, I'd be on my phone or I'd be watching something on a screen and it's really not effective. It's, it's kind of like listening to a webinar where you want the information, but you then zone out and are cooking and you're not, you know, it's like, what was the point of listening? Cause you, you actually didn't like hear anything that was really being right. said. Um, so it would maybe be better to, to, to listen to the whole thing and get the knowledge and then cook rather than try to like do both in a way in which you're distracted. Because I, I realized that, yeah, I, I never felt like I got a ton of milk when I was out, when I was pumping and I always kind of just like zoned out and I didn't think about Austin at all, which is what you should be doing. And it really helps. Um, and then obviously also your olfactory, you know, your smell and, and doing what you said with smelling something that smells like him. So all fabulous suggestions and just goes to show you that, you know, nothing is the same as breastfeeding and nursing, but that there are ways to still make this work. And the whole old saying, you know, don't let perfect be the enemy of good really applies. Right. But also, I think it's so important that people take away from this, that there is nothing that actually compares to just nursing your baby, Plus, you know, the old fashioned way. <laughs> if I may add, and I know I said this to you, babies are much cuter than breast pumps. So right. it brings that feeling to you of, oh, that effusive feeling of love, which is oxytocin high. And then the milk just lets down, but you don't get that expression or that feeling with a breast pump, no matter how cute it is. Right. And I will also add to that, that I found a lot of the early days and weeks and first few months of having my first baby to be pretty terrible. I mean, you're just, you know, if you're not nursing and pumping, you're sleep deprived and there's crying and you're just, you can't even find some time to, you know, brush your hair, brush your teeth. So you got to need the oxytocin and the, the positive emotions that come with the bonding and the release of that hormone to, I think, make up for a lot of the time throughout the rest of the day where you're feeling grumpy because you're not sleeping enough and you obviously can blame your baby because you would be sleeping otherwise. <laughs> um, and so you need that as a, as a balance to, uh, to keep going, to, to get to when it gets easier. I also wanted to add that my 
baby recently got COVID. And, you know, it was very scary because I'd never seen him sick. He'd never had a fever. And I was also grateful that he'd made it to nine months before he had any kind of illness. And I really attribute that to breastfeeding and giving him a strong immune system that way. Um, But I will say that I was so grateful that I wasn't fully weaned yet because I could continue to, like you mentioned, his saliva was informing my body that this pathogen, COVID-19, was in him and making him have a fever and a cough and, you know, all these issues. And so I was then able to help make the antibodies for him to then get better, which is, you know, the best vaccine out there, right? So uh, I just think about it, not so much always about what you want right now, but think about keeping your supply going and at least doing, you know, one nursing a day for a long time so that it's still there, so that you can still be that you know, natural vaccine, you can still make the antibody for whatever might come to your child, whether it's COVID or the flu or something else that he picks up or he or she picks up. So uh, that was so lucky. And I just felt so blessed that I still had the ability to nurse him and make that special antibody for him when he got, you know, quite, quite sick. And very luckily, his fever from beginning to end was less than 48 hours. And so, you know, he's, wow. he's bounced back very, very well. And I, again, attribute that to the breast milk because I didn't give him, you know, I give him vitamin D drops in the morning, um, but I didn't give him anything else. I didn't give him any baby, you know, Advil, Tylenol, all these things that some people do with fevers, nothing. So the only thing he got was breast milk and he recovered very well. All right. So my next question for you is, I know that you've always told me nurse as long as your baby wants it, but I know that it's advised, you know, to not give babies formula anymore or breast milk after let's say 12 or 15 months, they say either stop entirely and just go to food after that, or introduce some sort of just like milk, not formula, maybe it's cow's milk, goat's milk, et cetera. So can you explain how and why some moms still are nursing their children at, you know, three, four, five years old, but then the official recommendation is not to do that after 12 or 15 months. It seems in conflict to me. Right. It is in conflict and the official recommendation is wrong. (laughs) And I say that bravely. And here's why. Why would I wean my child from my own special blend to some cow out in the middle of who knows where or goat or horse or whatever, you know, um, babies do get nourishment from breast milk or human milk, as I should say, um, well beyond the first and second year. You know, there's a lot of protein and fat, mostly fat that really helps them to stay healthy. So that's one of those things that I see out in the world. And I, and I'm always confused by that. And I haven't been able to track down why that recommendation is there, because it is true that when we look at indigenous populations all over the planet and look back in our own history, that people were breastfeeding walking children. And I mean, five-year-olds and four-year-olds, and I myself was weaned at four. And my mother tells me every day, you know, I'm 57 now. She says, you know, there's a reason you've never been sick a day in your life because I kept you close. You know, she worked, she worked from the time I was six weeks of age. So that's another story we have to talk about one day. Um, It is true that the value of breast milk continues to be positive for children beyond that second year. And so I want to tell your reader, your listeners, anybody who's listening to this and in shame breastfeeding quietly, a two-year-old, a three-year-old, a five-year-old, a seven-year-old, that's okay. You're doing beautifully. You're doing the right thing for your child. We're the ones who are giving you bad information. And when I say we, I mean society. That's not true. The benefits are clearly there in children. Amazing. I remember when we first spoke, you were talking about some families you had where the mother has still been nursing a, and I laugh because I'm culturally programmed to think this is silly, but it's not. It's admirable and fabulous. And I'm I'm the problem by, by even laughing about it, but she was nursing a seven-year-old child and her, I think, four or five-year-old child, Year old, yes. and then also a new baby. And then, and then, you know, at that point, maybe the, the baby was already two, but, but she had been doing it and, and this, you had a term for it. It was, um, tandem nursing, tandem nursing. Right. And I think of like a tandem bike, um, 
and a mom with all the little, you know, kids in the back of the bike. It's, it's hilarious, but also so incredible. And I will add something else, which might, you know, help people to see that this, that, that you're right, that the official recommendation is wrong. And that is, there's a book called Sapiens. It's a fabulous book. It was written by an Israeli professor, and it's about the history of Homo sapiens and how, you know, before we were like we are today, how did we separate from gorillas and other uh, species to become so uh, dominant on the planet? And there were, you know, tens of thousands of years of our of our development. Um, as our current species before farming. And so, you know, like, how did we live nomadically? How did that all work? And it's so interesting. It's one of my favorite books to cite. But one thing I remember is that because they were nomadic and meaning they were moving around a lot before agriculture, uh, they would because they were following herds of food and where there was fresh food, right? They weren't going to stay in a cold wintry place, they would go to where there was going to be food to eat. And they needed the children to be able to walk. They couldn't, so they they would nurse because they figured out that it was, it, I should say, decreased fertility. We all know it does not eliminate fertility. You can still very much get pregnant when nursing, but um, because it decreased fertility, they would continue to nurse until each child was about three or four years old, because then they were fully able to walk and be self-sufficient and, and, you know, help themselves with bathroom and this and that Not bathroom or, you know, going, going to pee your poop. <laughs> and they couldn't have another infant if the first child wasn't uh, able to do all of that. So their way of making sure that didn't happen or, or trying to help that from not happening was to, was to nurse. And so um, they had actually far less disease and illness. One, because a lot of disease and illness is when people live too close together, right? And so these villages that you hear of like the middle ages, that's why everyone's always sick because they're unsanitary to live so close and spread disease to one another. So they weren't doing that. So that obviously helped too. But you have to think that breastfeeding till three or four years old also gave them fabulous immune systems. The average age of death was earlier because they got, you know, like eaten by a wild animal more so, right? It wasn't because of disease. It wasn't the modern day diseases that we have today. The immune system support, I always thought was just just such an, an unsung hero <laughs> for homo sapiens before, before agriculture. And why do you think the official recommendation is what it is if it's not right? Um, that's a really loaded question and I'm gonna take the chance and answer it anyway. You know, we live in a consumer society. This is a capitalist country and there is no money to be made if a woman or a family chooses to provide human milk to their child. So if we look at it from a jaded, relatively jaded perspective, if there's no profit in breast milk, then how do we convince families that this particular food is only appropriate for a specific amount of time so that we can get them to be involved in consumerism of other foods for these children. Well, we tell them that it's not, it's not necessary. And we identify the behavior as sexual because many times, you know, families will say, well, you know, it's my breast and I don't want my three-year-old opening my bra and helping him or herself because we're seeing it through a particular prism. We're looking at these children and these families and assuming something that, that does not exist in, the, in that way most of the time. And so my perspective, and this is just my opinion, is that in order for these companies, these dairy companies to really, you know, make their profits nice and high, they have lobbied the government to convince us, to convince society that this is no longer a necessity. I mean, you know, your mother or people who's in their maybe 30s and 40s, their mothers were told when they were born in the 60s and 70s, it, it, don't breastfeed, that's not good for your baby. We've got formula in the West and this is the stuff that makes the baby fat. It turns out we don't want babies to be fat unless they're fat on breast milk, we want them to be healthy. And so the, the identification of weight as an issue in babies gaining weight and being bigger can be easily sort of plucked from um, a mother's feeling of security when you say to her, well, you see how skinny this child is? He's a year and a half and he's on your milk. We need to fatten him up. And so this particular company can make something that's going to fatten up your child. It just kind of, you know, abrades our confidence, right? Many things that have to do with health are a 
what we've seen over the years, a systematic campaign of misinformation and lobbying, not only the government, but medical schools and individual doctors, which we're seeing very much right now with pharmaceutical companies and the amount of, you know, quote unquote, speaker fees and all these under the table payments that um, to, to doctors to prescribe their drugs. And it's really very systematic. And uh, they did the same thing with tobacco. They tried to convince you know, the American consumer that that was actually good for you at some point. And high fructose corn syrup. Right. And, and then, you know, the, the sh- I, I mean, you look at the history of the back and forth between the sugar lobby and the salt and the dairy lobby, and they all had their way of pointing the finger at the other one. Oh, salt is bad. Sugar is bad. You know, all this back and forth, back and forth. Uh, fat is bad. Oh, they were all about that. You know, turns out healthy fats, like the most important thing for our brains. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a campaign by somebody, somebody is trying to point the finger at somebody else, uh, or to, you know, kind of make people believe that something is bad and that their product or their industry is good. It's, it's human nature, it's corporate nature. And it's very sad, as I mentioned, that the United States has now become this way because the global formula industry, I think is like 98% American owned. And so our government wants to support our industries, right? Of course. And so it, it tends to kind of not talk about how important breastfeeding is or that, you know, that, that it's not the same, you know, and, and I don't want to just leave people with this, like formula is bad, breast milk and nursing is, the, is, is good. And that's it. It's a black and white issue. It's more that they are not the same. <laughs> that's my main message. Um, not the same and consider the source. If somebody right. is running it from the profit-driven perspective, we as the individuals who choose to use these products have to be aware of that aspect of it. Right. And I and I urge anybody who, you know, whose doctor has told them it's the same or just make sure you're supplementing or this and that to take some of the statistics I mentioned earlier today about, you know, these, these studies over just the last five years. And I'm sure if I looked at the five years before that, there'd be even more in the five years going forward, there'd be even more uh, to show why you might not want to do that. And, you know, with all of the industrialization of our food today and all of our Mm -hmm. products, you know, putting your baby's life in the hands of Abbott, who knowingly, apparently, according to this whistleblower, uh, and these official complaints, which you can find, ignored these, you know, complaints of unsanitary and, you know, contaminated conditions, working conditions, I think it was as early as February 2021. And the first baby didn't die from this contamination until I think it was March of 2022. So over a year to do something about it, and it didn't even involve shutting it down just cleaning it up or just figuring out why there was contamination. It it was just, you know, so heartbreaking to me. And so I think one reason, and I hate to get down, you know, this should be a really hopeful conversation because for anybody that has ever struggled with breastfeeding to know it can be so much better and also how great it is as medicine for your child for the rest of time. And I should say medicine now that the benefit you will see with their immune system and their gut health and their digestive issues for decades and decades to come. One of the questions that I ask private holistic patient advocacy clients that I have is when they're going through their initial intake is, were you breastfed as a baby and for how long? Because if they're having digestive issues or other health issues linked to their gut or their immune system, it's helpful for me to know if they were breastfed for a year. Okay, so maybe they had the foundation or they weren't breastfed at all. Okay. Well, that's one of the root causes. Maybe going back to what I was going to say, it's a little negative, but a corporation doesn't have a soul, right? There's no human being behind it. There might be a CEO, but he or she is hired by the board and can be fired and usually is never there for more than, you know, 10 years, maybe uh, usually less. You can't believe some of these seemingly evil things that can be done in the name of profit or in the name of corporatism but it's because there's no soul there. And so why should we expect them to do what a soulful person would do, which is maybe the right thing to do or the humane thing to do or the compassionate thing to do? We shouldn't. There is no soul there. It has a mission. It has fiduciary duties to make money for the shareholders and that's it. And so sometimes there's a conflict between 
what's the humane thing to do, the soulful thing to do, and that duty to make money. So I've gotten to the point where I accept that's how it works. I still think that capitalism is a better system than anything else I've seen, uh, but we have these issues. And so when you can take it into your own power, when you can become informed yourself and control the things that you can control, like trying to feed your child from your own breasts or um, you know, buying food that's grown at farms nearby that you can see have good practices and that you can see the practices yourself um, or growing your own food or whatever it might be, those are steps you can take to negate some of the negative aspects of corporations and industry and, and lobbying and all that. Um, you can't do it for everything, right? And you have to just relinquish that control a little bit. But when it comes to babies, I don't want to relinquish that kind of control, right? I want to reward good companies with good practices that I can see and not even go there if I can help it by breastfeeding myself, right? I just, I eliminate the chances of something bad happening or not eliminate. I should never say that. I reduce the chances by by bringing this home, by bringing this inside. Um, and by, by that, I mean by nursing and breastfeeding. And uh, I'll just say one last thing. I, all my friends who have now worked with you feel like you're such a, a godsend as well. And we always talk about just, you know, what Andrea says, just go back to nature. You know, if your baby is nursing six, eight times a day and every three hours, then you need to be nursing for the beginning, even if it means sleep deprivation or you have to sleep in shifts and this and that, uh, doing the same. Because once you start messing with nature, you know, once you miss that middle of the night feed and then you sleep through it and your body thinks you don't need it and supply goes out of whack or you, you just start messing with things, everything starts to get a little bit wonky from there. So when you cannot mess with nature, when, you know, you can let it do its thing and that applies for regenerative farming as well, right? It applies with climate change and everything, <laughs> literally everything. You're going to stay in a better place. <laughs> it's called going with the flow. Right? right. Going with the flow. And that's where I say, you know, we have done a disservice. You know, we have tried to manage breastfeeding for families rather than empowering mothers who choose to breastfeed or women who choose to breastfeed with the understanding that their baby or babies are very well equipped to do their jobs. And our job as the mother in this situation, I mean, all you have to do is help that baby. You don't have to do it for him or her. You know, but if you have the time, I want to go back to something you said. Um, you know, it, it makes no sense for this corporation because there's no soul at the center of it. Yes, to do the right thing. But most of these corporations are multi-corporations. In other words, they also have stocks or ownership in medicine and pharmaceutical companies. So I feed my baby this formula, whatever brand, and I know that down the road, there will be some health issues. So the corporation knows, well, you know, we're going to give this baby this food and eventually he's, he or she's going to end up taking some kind of medication for some kind of digestive tract issue because as you said you know these foods tend to promote health issues in babies so you said to me initially you know there's all this research about the reduce in risk of ovarian cancer and all of these things but i want you to think of it the other way around not breastfeeding increases your risk for breast cancers ovarian cancers not breastfeeding your child increase increases their risk for all of these health issues. What he expects not to smoke, but if you smoke, you're increasing your risk of lung cancers. Your right. body expects to breastfeed. And if you don't, you're increasing your risk for breast cancers. Right. Because right? the body's yeah. default is not to get cancer, right? The body's <laughs> default is not to get endometriosis or to have a baby die of SIDS or, or any of these other things. So like you you're, that's a fabulous way of thinking about it. So all the studies that I mentioned about, you know, lowering endometriosis risk, no, it's, it's not breastfeeding raises your endometriosis risk. Boom. And, <laughs> right. So I, yeah, of course I, sh that's, a, but, that's, but we don't often think of it because we're looking for a reduction in risk. Whereas if we really sit and put some two minutes of thought into it, we realize this is not what the body expected. So maybe what I'm actually doing is I'm increasing my risk of fill in the blank, right? Right. Yes. 
wow, I feel like my mind is blown just thinking about that. I'm looking <laughs> back at all the studies I pulled out. I'm like, oh my gosh, breastfeeding then increases your ovarian cancer risk, your risk for early menopause, like all these things. Um, it <sighs> just really brings it home. And I'm weaning and now I'm like, should I even be weaning? <laughs> but, um, you know, we'll, we'll revisit that. I remember you first said to me, I was so adamant when we first spoke about that I was going to stop at six months because it was just so hellish to me, the experience. And this is right around three months when he was three months. And you said, you know, I support you no matter what, which was excellent Jedi mind trick, because I knew that you were just, you know, making me feel comfortable, but really wanting me to go longer. And you said that you save babies you know, by doing your work one baby at a time. And I just felt like that was so special and that you have saved my baby because of course, neither you or I could have foreseen that he was then going to be sick with COVID. And, and I don't think that generally babies are at, at any sort of risk of, of death or hospitalization from COVID. I think it's only babies that have other complications that that happens to, which luckily he does not. And I shouldn't, I should say luckily, but also because of how much breast milk this child has had. Right. Um, and so, you know, you did save him in that way. And I didn't have to introduce, you know, these other medicines that come with a whole host of other side effects as well. Um, I know that, you know, certainly when a fever goes, above 103, they advised giving some sort of thing to bring it down. And he was right at 102.5. And I was right there thinking, am I going to, should I, and, and really resisting giving it. And I did, and it came down and I didn't have to, uh, but, but it's like, once you mess with nature, once you introduce these man-made things, even though I'm sure he would have been, you know, not a, not a huge negative result of taking it, but little by little introduction of all this other stuff introduces all these other potential issues and risks. And you're trusting corporate America, whoever you know makes Tylenol, to not have contaminated factories. You don't know when the last complaint was in the children's Tylenol factory, you know, that they may have ignored. Who knows? You're introducing all these other things. And life is complicated enough. Why are we introducing these things? Let's keep it simple, right? So this is all the wisdom I took away from this experience and from working with you. And so I'm going to, you know, let you go because I know there's plenty of women who need you uh, today. But is there anything we haven't spoken about that you'd want to share and want, you know, people to know whether they support somebody who's going to be breastfeeding, whether they've done it themselves, whether they're doing it now? What would you say? If you choose to have a child and you choose to breastfeed your child or somebody else's child, it's a choice. So feel good in your choice, no matter what that decision is. That's great. And yeah, I want and- to thank you, Adrian, for choosing a virtual session with me. You know, for years I had done a technique called HOT, hands-off technique, and that's why I'm very successful at my global practice, virtual global practice. Yes. So I don't need I will- to ask anybody to see what's going on. I will add that I was very skeptical before we did it, that you would be able to actually see what was going on because the angle, of course, you know, it's not the same. And I thought, how could he, she possibly see what he's doing with his mouth and blah, blah, blah. And you explained it to me after. And I thought it was pretty amazing that there's all these other ways that you can tell and how he swallows was one of them. You know, is he actually gulping down milk or is he just sucking with his mouth? Because of course, if there's no liquid there, he doesn't need to gulp. So the the rate of the gulping was a way that you could tell this and that. And then obviously also seeing, you know, how he was sucking and things. So it's brilliant. Whatever you figured out, uh, you figured it out. So it was virtual. And I live in an area where there weren't a lot of, I think, lactation consultants who could come to my house. And so it wasn't going to work for me either if I had to travel, you know, to where, where you were. And I think you're in New York. Yeah. So um, it worked out for me and, and it makes it accessible for people to work with you all over the world. So I really am glad that you mentioned the fact that you're a virtual practice because a lot of lactation consultants maybe have not mastered that skill of being able to see exactly what's going on virtually. And so it limits the universe of who can work with them. Anyway, thank you so much, Andrea. This was just uh, so 
fun to talk about this experience and get all of this knowledge to my audience because, you know, when you go through something so profound, you feel like you have to share it. You know, it's just, that's just the way human beings are. And so between everything I've learned over the last couple of years about the health benefits of breastfeeding slash the health risks of not breastfeeding, which we really should be saying. And then obviously working with you and how much the situation turned around for me. I just, it was all so impactful and um, people should really know. And so, like you said, it's not about judgment. It's about knowing from the beginning that there might be reasons it's not working for you. And so you don't need to throw in the towel uh, just because it's not working for you. You, you can do so many things and, and talk to amazing uh, consultants like yourself to troubleshoot. Yes, there's always another way. Yeah, the troubleshooting is just such a great way to turn it around. And it certainly did for me. So thank you so much again for being on the show and for all of your help with uh, Austin's health for years and years to come. And your health as well, my dear. And my health, of course. Thank right. you. Thank yes. you for having me. I really enjoyed the conversation today, Adrian. Me too. Okay. Thank you again. Bye. Well.